All right, guys, welcome back to the Hunter's Quest podcast. This is your host, Hunter McWaters. Today I am joined by Tony Smotherman, the traveling hunter. What's, What's up, going man? on, guys? <laughs> How you doing, dude? Shoot, man, doing pretty fair, bro, for, for June anyways. Yeah, Tuesday evening in June. Yes, sir. Yeah, and um, so I met Tony uh, this year at the Western Hunt Expo out in Salt Lake. And we did a, a little short podcast, but um, I knew at some point I had to get you back on because, uh, I don't know, you're fun to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate you, man. I appreciate the opportunity to be back on your podcast. Yeah, man. It's good to be. It's good to have you back. And, um, and you are from Tennessee, is that correct? I am, bro. I live just outside of Nashville, Tennessee. And, okay. Um, I, I know um, you call me Traveling Hunter, but that's kind of my nickname from way back in the day because I... Well, I've pretty much spent six months on the road hunting since I was 19 years old. And wow. you can kind of tell by the gray area here below <laughs> my chin line is I'm not 19 years old anymore. So I do live in Tennessee. My mail goes to Tennessee, but I spend a whole lot of time in other great states as well. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, so like I said, when we met, we were in Salt Lake. And I was actually, I, I was actually born in Nashville and lived what? out really? there. Yeah. Oh, well, man. That's... I didn't realize that. So I'm about just right now. So I am probably uh 25 minutes from downtown nashville okay cool yeah so my a lot of my family like my parents are both from paducah kentucky you bet very familiar with paducah yeah and so they you know a lot of people i don't know about anymore but used to be back in the day a lot of the a lot of the kids that kind of wanted to do something with their lives move from paducah to nashville and so they ended up there and that's that's where i was born so man it it still is a great place it's just a whole lot busier than it was when we were uh, little fellas for sure. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I lived out there for a summer in college um, and almost moved out there to, to actually try to do the music thing for a while, um, but ended up going on a different route. But uh, fun town. It, it is a busy town. And, <laughs> you know, uh, of course, I was born and raised here, and I have a hard time playing the radio, let alone playing music. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but everybody thinks because I fly out of Nashville that I'm some kind of musician of some sort and most time when i'm flying out of nashville it's with a gun case and they're like oh so what's in the gun case and i'm like yeah it's not what you're thinking it's a gun <laughs> it's a gun <laughs> um well that's cool man so um uh, i know you've been traveling well just give folks a quick background um i know a little bit about your story but not a ton uh, i know you've been in the outdoor industry for a long time um you're host of a tv show at one point um so yeah just love to hear just a little bit about you and how you got into stuff and your backstory yeah absolutely man you know so so everybody wants to be um well everybody that i know that's not in the hunting industry they want to be in the hunting industry uh and i knew <laughs> at a very early age that i want to be in the hunting industry and um you know it kind of started um i don't know it kind of started a, a weird way if you will um i was raised hunting and fishing here in middle tennessee my dad was a big coon hunter Mm -hmm. um, so I spent a lot of time in the outdoors, but we were chasing coons. And basically when I was a young man, that's kind of how we fed our family was, was harvesting coons, harvesting the pelt and taking the pelts to fur trade days at the end of hunting season. Mm. Um, and that's kind of how we made money. And back then furs were, well, they were worth something. Uh, a really good yeah. size coon would bring 25 bucks. Um, nice. so where are you running tree and walkers trade day with, with hundreds of them, you know, it, it actually kind of turned into, uh, pretty good amount of money yeah um, but what kind of hounds did you in, what kind of hounds did you, what kind of hounds did you run did you have tree and walkers but so we had uh, we had walker hounds um there was neighbors that were competitive uh of us and they were all blue tick dudes but we okay. were all tri-color walkers nice okay i used to have a tree and walker that thing was awesome oh man dude uh so um i grew up with give or take 30 walker dogs in wow. my backyard my whole entire life okay so i'm from 
Southeast Virginia, and so we – I don't do it so much anymore because we kind of moved, but um, – the guy there. I was in a dog club, but we we ran deer with dogs. I don't know if they do that in Tennessee. We do not, but I'm I'm familiar with the sport for sure. Okay, and uh, there is something special about the smell of twenty dogs in July in the South. You know, it's like so. I obviously <laughs> I love dogs, um, but my dad was a true houndsman. Um, that was what he loved to do. Yes, hunting coons and harvesting coons and and things like that was part of it. But at the end of the day. It was all about the dogs for him. He was a yep. true houndsman. Um, and, and, of course, as I got older, you know, a young man's mind changes a little bit and things become more important than others. And I uh, <laughs> got to run and kind of with the wrong crowd when I become a teenager and was doing some wilder things. And uh, I had a, a kid that I, uh, was in uh, FFA class or ag class, as we know it, um, was in ag class and he, uh, asked me, you know, was I hunting? I'm like, Oh yeah. You know, I've been running coon house my whole life. And he's like, Oh no, man. He said, you don't hunt deer. And I'm like, Hmm, I, I can't say I've ever seen one to be honest with you. I said, no, I, I, I don't hunt deer. Um, I said, my dad talks about them all the time because our, our dogs would jump a deer at night and run up to the next County and deer is kind of my enemy. And he's yeah. like, well, he said, Matt, why don't you come by my house one afternoon? And he said, I'd like to, uh, maybe show you how to shoot a bow and arrow. Oh, okay. Well, heck, I, I ain't never seen no bow and arrow up close, but yeah, I'd like to try it. Um, so anyway, see, I uh, went out to that guy's house that afternoon, shot the bow, uh, become overly infatuated uh, with archery hunting. Uh, and it basic, basically, at the end of the day, consumed my life uh, to the point where I quit running with the wrong crowd. I quit mm -hmm. doing things that I shouldn't be doing because I was 100% focused on hunting whitetail. Uh, and so I... I took out reading every publication that I could get my hands on deer and deer hunting, North American white yes, tail. I uh, love that. So and so forth. Um, yeah. and basically when I, when I got up to about 19, 20 years old, I realized that, well, I mean, uh, not to sound weird, but the outdoors kind of saved me, uh, cause mm. I was very much headed down the wrong path. And thankfully that gentleman introduced me to bow hunting and, uh, it basically changed my whole world, uh, for the good. Yeah. So I knew that I wanted to do outdoor industry stuff. I just didn't know if that was a thing when I was 20 years old because mm -hmm. uh, the outdoor industry that we all know and love and, and want to be a part of today, well, it was kind of a, it kind of didn't exist back right. when I was 19, 20 years old. So um, I started out um, figuring out that, it, that the only way that I could really introduce other people to the outdoors was becoming an outdoor rider. Uh, and this goes back to kind of a lifelong lesson. Um, if you want to do something bad enough in life, you'll figure out a way. Yep. Um, and you'll do it for free if you have to. School, yeah. You know, when <laughs> I was in high school, my my worst subject was English. And I, I, I mean, really now, some of my buddies tell me I have a hard time speaking English now. But um, so they kind of give me some grief about that. But uh, I knew that I wanted to be uh, in the outdoor industry. I knew that my only vehicle at that time, because there was no social media, there was no Zoom, there was no podcast, no YouTube, mm -hmm. none of that. So I had to basically sit down and hand write letters uh, to different editors across the country and basically submit ideas I had about articles. Mm. And uh, before you know it, I was writing for multiple different publications. I uh, was writing for uh, a publication here in my home state called Tennessee Outdoor News, uh, which was just a statewide publication. Um, and then, of course, my my background um, up until this point is kind of a self-employed entrepreneurial spirit, if you will. So I knew very quickly early on that writing for a publication definitely got the voice that I wanted to get out there about how awesome the outdoors is and was. Mm -hmm. But it also drove me to do better, uh, meaning that within two years of writing for my home state's publication, um, I ended up buying the publication from the oh, owner nice. uh, and turned into owner, publisher, writer, editor. Um, and so I ran it with my wife for 10 years. Uh, and then after 10 years, I had 40 writers working for me full time and the publication had grown immensely. Um, but I knew when I was doing that as again, if you want to do something bad enough, you'll figure out a way. So as I was writing, I knew that I, I wanted a bigger platform to tell the story of 
outdoors is an awesome place. Uh, and my next step was jumping into outdoor television. Yeah. And there's one piece in there that I skipped as I was writing. Um, I ran into a young lady that worked for night rifles or, uh, everybody oh, yeah. knows my guest today is night muzzle loaders. Mm-hmm. Um, I ran into one, uh, a gal that was the marketing manager there for night at the time. And, and it showed her a few of my pieces and, and a lot of the pieces I had was using a night muzzle loader because, you know, if you write a hunting story, um, typically the ones that talk about big bucks are the ones that gets the most love and most play. Yeah. <laughs> just uh, so like, figured, just well, like videos. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I knew then if I wanted to uh, get my articles read even more that it, it had to have big bucks in it. And yeah. the only place the big bucks were hanging out uh, were other states than I lived in. So mm-hmm. I traveled pretty heavily. And this is kind of where the traveling hunter scenario comes into play is um, I started traveling and living in my truck through Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Iowa, Kansas, Nebraska, uh, and kind of bounced across the country. Uh, during muzzleloader seasons because those Midwestern states at the time yeah. were shotgun or muzzleloader only. Yep. So that's where my passion and love for muzzleloading come to be was when I started working with Knight. And you were hitting um, public land, I'm assuming, in there? Yeah, a lot of public, well, pretty much all public land at that yeah. time. Now, of course, I don't do as much public land as I used to. Uh, but at that time, yeah, it was bounced from public ground to public ground. And um, I traveled in a 1991 Toyota pickup truck that had a, nice. a copper shell on the back and that's what I lived in for six months, um, from state to state. Nice. Yeah. So, um, I was out gathering data, uh, for articles, if you will, uh, <laughs> during those six months. Um, and I eventually started writing, uh, as my relationship with night muzzleloaders grew, I started writing their instructional and safety DVDs for all the gun models that would come out each year. And, okay. and then I started posting the instructional DVDs um, for every gun model that come out and eventually started hosting Night Rifles Born to Hunt Television, which aired on the Outdoor Channel for about, I believe it was actually five seasons. Um, Man, when I was about 16 years old, I got a night muzzleloader for Christmas one year, and I remember the video. I wonder if it was you on there I was watching. It very well could have been. If it wasn't me on there, if I hadn't transitioned to hosting them, I was definitely writing them at that time. Interesting, man. Um, yeah, so it just kind of morphed, you know, and again, it's just if you want to do something bad enough, you figure out a way to do it. And um, I, I just knew what I wanted to do, and I knew that, you know, it's almost like, and we talk about the outdoors in general, it's like, I hate to, I know we just come off this COVID thing a couple of years ago, and but the outdoors is an infectious thing. If you uh install that outdoor love and infection that that kid installed in me when i was in high school um it really can get people's life refocused um Mm -hmm. because it it, it saved me at the end of the day um because i was doing a whole lot of bad things i shouldn't be doing and if it wasn't for the outdoors basically just captivating me who knows where i would be today probably not in this chair uh on this podcast working full time uh, mm-hmm. in a dream job working for CVA muzzleloaders now. Um, but there's, you know, there's always a path, uh, and a plan, you know, the man upstairs had a plan for me a long time ago. And, uh, in my teenage years, I thought it was partying, uh, but apparently it was not, it was being in the muzzleloading industry. <laughs> <laughs> nice man. Um, I want to, I want to go back a couple of things you said there. A lot of your story reminds me of myself because, um, I was, I grew up, where I grew up, it was shotgun, muzzleloader, and archery only. And, um, and I was the same way, man. Like, so my dad, you know, got me into hunting, but he was, he was really duck hunter, waterfowler, loved dove hunting and stuff like that. And, um, and then he got me my first bow. And actually, first time I ever went bow hunting was on public land in the LBL. Oh, dude, bro. I yeah. cut my teeth on LBL up there, man. They got okay. the best muzzleloading season ever up there. Yeah, and so so my dad grew up growing up, up in Paducah. Him and my uncle, technically he's my cousin. So my dad and his cousin, they just lived in the LBL and just that's they bow hunted. And that's all they did. And so they we kind of this sort of family reunion. I got a picture of it actually right back here, my thing. And my dad bought me a bow. We went in, and, and me and my cousin, um, we we and we all you know, hunting there. We, of course we didn't see a thing, but, uh, you know, it was fun. And then, and then we got permission to hunt on some land up here, uh, on the Eastern shore of Virginia. And I remember that first night 
going and sitting in a, on a little bean field and like 14 deer came out in that field and just had no idea it was there for, you know, two, three hours, you know, you know, inside of 70, 80 yards. And I was just like hooked, like in all through high school, I wasn't going to parties on the weekends. I was driving out there by myself and hunting all weekend. Um, you know, reading deer and deer hunter magazine, watching the Drury, you know, Drury guys on TV, Oh, or on the you know, getting the V8, you know, Dream Season Eight on VHS, and, <laughs> and that like Friday night I was watching Dream Season, and then Saturday I was driving up there as soon as I could drive, and uh, before that my dad would drive me up there and um, you know walk me out to the stand, and so um, for me it was like just something about seeing those deer out there, just I was hooked after that. But it sounds like for you it was more about the archery itself. Is that what it was? You think? Yeah, you know so. I think the, I think what about or what in, um, uh, captivated me about the archery side of things is is my mind is very mechanical. I ain't a smart guy by any stretch, but I can tear your car apart in the lawn out there and put it back together in about 24 hours. And so I'm really big into custom plastic hot rods here now. Okay. Uh, but my mind has always been very mechanical and the archery side of things. And I think so I think that's what got me into muzzling too. But the archery side of things, you know, you got to do, you got to uh, figure out your your broadhead weight, and and you got to tune it to your fletchings, and you got to figure out helical or straight, and kinetic energy and FOCs, and there's a lot of mechanics that yeah. goes into archery. And I think that's why it was such an easy transition for me uh, to be overtaken by the muzzleloading world. Is yeah. muzzleloaders, in essence, are the same way. It's not like you go buy a 270 at your local sporting goods store, put a bullet in it or a casing in it, squeeze the trigger and it goes bang. Muzzle loaders, you have to, number one, figure out which powder you're going to use, pelletize or loose, you're going to weigh it, is it going to be volumetric, um, projectile weight. Uh, I mean, the, the list goes on and on and on yeah. about mechanics of muzzle loading. Uh, so I think that's why that, that it, it really jumped on me pretty hard. And, and also a lot of the states through the Midwest didn't allow our centerfire rifles. So, yep. but mm -hmm. yes, it was archery that really took me over and took me by surprise. But I think it was the mechanical aspect of it, of all the moving pieces. It really make things happen. Yeah. Yeah, man. I, I used to just shoot my bow. Like I was probably 10 times better shot with my bow when I was 14 than I am right now. Like, cause uh, I was just all I would do all the time. I had a tree stand in my backyard and I would just practice my 3d target like I would wake up at like six a.m. in the summer and like and just wait for squirrels to shoot in my backyard. I lived in like a neighborhood. <laughs> it's funny how life changes when we get a little bit older. But I was the same way. I, I wasn't fourteen, but it was probably more like sixteen, seventeen that I just could not stop shooting yeah. my bow. Yeah, man. Um, so that's that's funny, man. Um, let's see. There's a few other things I wanted to. Um, so did did. Uh, did your dad was he kind of like was he supportive or was he kind of like hey let's go coon hunting you're like no i'm going deer hunting there what was that kind of dynamic like well so so he was supportive for sure but he could not figure out why in the world i would want to go sit in a tree stand for hours on end yeah. hoping a deer showed up when we could go turn the dogs loose turn them out in a cornfield somewhere other than have a, a coon tree in a matter of minutes yeah he just couldn't figure out his his level of patience uh, was a bit different than mine. And I, I, one thing I think, too, that really drove me harder into deer hunting, and it's almost like the bigger, it's like the Tim the Toolman Taylor scenario, bigger is better. <laughs> yeah. So I remember growing up, the only rifle I knew uh, that even existed was a Winchester Model 67A single shot 22 rifle. That's yeah. all my dad hunted with. He was a big collector of those because it was a okay. great painting gun. And, you know, the 22 rifle shell is a little short guy. And yeah. I remember one day, one of his friends come over, a big coon hunter guy, uh, and he, but he also deer hunted. And he pulled out a 270 shell. And from somebody who has only seen a 22 rifle 22. their whole life, it looked like a missile. Yeah. I'm like, what is that? Yeah. He's like, oh, it's a deer rifle. It's a deer caliber. It's 270. I'm like, I don't even know what that is, but dude, I want a part of that because that's a monster shell. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so I think that also kind of pulled me into uh, shooting these big caliber guns that we shoot today when I grew up shooting this little plink yeah. can shooting gun, you know, a little 22. Yeah, man. And it's been like interesting for me too, like along that same line, because like I said, where I grew up, I could only bow hunt and, and, 
you know, shotgun. So I mainly focused on bow hunting and some muzzle loading and some shotgun, but mainly it was about bow season for me. And, and so, you know, when I found Western hunting like three or four years ago, Oof. um, it oh, was another animal there, bro. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> it's like, I, I, for me, it was just like, Oh yeah. Rifle, you know, you just like throw a scope on there and you know, whatever. And, and then I realized like, there's a lot more to like precision rifle shooting and shooting at distance. Mm. And, um, and that's been a really cool journey for me. Like, you know, like, something as simple to someone who's very experienced as, you know, mounting your own optic onto a firearm and doing it well and doing it correctly. I had no idea how to do any of that. Um, and learning that whole process and, and really getting a rifle dialed in is, is also cool. It's just, it's just a different, different thing. A lot of mechanics to that as well. You know, like back in the day, you'd have to lap your rings and or your rings yeah. and put a scope on it. To make I still sure do that. Improved. I still do that, but like we were saying earlier, those Seekins rings, you don't really have to mess with oh, those bro. much. I mean, I run Seekins on everything I got, and man, oh man, it is so nice not to have to lap my rings. I know. Places, you know? I put that tool on there, like right out of the box, and it's just like, bing. Oh, yeah, they're money, bro. It's precision yeah. as you get. So, so technology is a wonderful thing when it comes to manufacturing rings like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, man. So so you got into it through writing, and then I know you, you said you started kind of hosting some different stuff. And I'm assuming probably it was your your uh, your charm and your southern personality that kind of helped you uh, shine in front of the camera. But um, <laughs> I don't know. You... I, everybody says I'm full of crap. It's a Christmas turkey, so I'm not sure what <laughs> what got me there. But but I, I knew that I uh, I knew that I I almost felt like all right. So. So I, I dig way deep in here. So yeah, you know, as I was going through and I was was outdoor riding and become a magazine owner uh, and was venturing into hosting DVDs for night muzzle loaders and really was super intrigued uh, by the camera, mm -hmm. uh, not to be some superstar or blah, 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 but I knew that it would get me to a different audience, a bigger, broader audience. And I had, I had, uh, I was going to a church there um, back when I was um, in my late twenties, and the pastor of that church um, was a big turkey hunter, um, mm. and I felt like I felt like comfortable enough to talk to him. I said, "Man, you know," I said, I, "I need to know." I said, "Why in the world are you a pastor of a church?" I said, "Because <laughs> I, I, I don't, I don't know anybody other than you that." that does what you do, but I do know when I was in high school, that's not what anybody talked about. They didn't, mm -hmm. Nobody talked about being a pastor of church. They wanted to be a policeman, a fireman, blah, 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 doctor, right. or so on and so forth. And he goes, man, that's just, that's just what I thought I was supposed to do. So that's what I did. I'm like, oh, okay. I said, well, here's a really weird statement. But I said, you know, when I was a, a, a younger man transitioning between a youth to teenager, I said, I had some awkward times there where I was getting a little sideways with things. And I said, the outdoors, I said, I believe it's, truthfully what saved me uh, um, i said obviously the man upstairs had a plan uh the outdoors was it i said I, I think i'm supposed to be you know i think i'm supposed to work in some kind of hunting industry or something i said but i i don't know if that's really such a thing um that it is today and he goes hey man if you think that's what you're supposed to do you just figure it out you just figure yeah. it out and it started by magazine ownership, and then the next step was into hosting DVDs, or writing DVDs and hosting them, then went into television. And to give me a broader audience, and it wasn't to, for fame or fortune per se, if you will, uh, but it was about just reaching uh, a new demographic of individuals that I could not do uh, as a writer. Uh, and, it, and I wanted to make sure that they understand or understood what kind of amazing time that I was having on these trips, on these yeah. hunts per se. Uh, and again, it wasn't to, to be uh, bragging or boasting. It's like, this is amazing. You know, so I want you guys to live vicariously through me and I want yeah. you guys to strive and uh, earn to try to be in the outdoor industry or at least go partake in some kind of outdoor activity because mm -hmm. it's a darn great place to be. And as, as we know it today, modern times here today, you know, the, the youth that's coming up today are tied up in, well, just all kind of craziness this world is, has in it right now. Yeah. Video games and all the bad stuff on these phones and computers that they have access to today. If they got outside and spent some time behind a fishing pole or behind a BB gun, 
uh, it would make them uh, a different human being and a better human yeah. being, I think, at the end of the day. So that's kind of the reason I got into TV was to reach a broader audience and make sure they understand what an awesome time I was having and what a cool um, cool thing it was to experience all these great outdoor locations from Newfoundland to Alaska to New Zealand. Um, and oh, and nice. as, it, as it got to growing, um, after doing the Night Rifle Born to Hunt TV, I hosted um, a show for Summit Tree Stands called Summit's High Places. Mm -hmm. uh, then it went to Moultrie's The Hit List for Moultrie Game Cameras. And then after that, again, me being the kind of guy I am and I want to do my own thing and I have ideas and vision, I started my own show, uh, which was called Traveling Hunter, uh, because that's kind of what I signed off in all my articles as was Traveling Hunter. And all my buddies called me that just because that's what I was doing all the time. Um, and then I hosted that show on the Sportsman Channel for five seasons. So nice. uh, it, it gave me a big platform to show a lot of people there's a lot of great places in this country to go hang out and see and hunt and fish. Yeah, man. So those those early shows you hosted, were those like shows that somebody was producing and they're kind of like, hey, we need a host, and they kind of like came to you? or did Exactly. You, yeah, that, that's exactly okay. what it was. Summit Tree Stands did, this, did that, uh, and then Moultrie also did the same thing. That's cool. Yeah. And then, um, and then when it came to doing your own show, then you're um, – in there pitching it to try to find sponsors and all that stuff too. I'm assuming, right? That's when things got real. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody different. wants their own TV show till they do it. So, um, I so found out myself how much work this thing is, dude. It's a lot of work, bro. It's a lot yeah. of work and it never quits. You know I mean? I, I found myself up, uh, a lot, uh, at two or three o'clock in the morning when it was quiet and going through video footage and things like that. And, um, I did not edit my own show. I was, uh, very close friends, uh, with the producer, uh, at that time, Lee and Tiffany show called getting close, which was their original show. The producer of that show was a really good friend of mine. And I knew if I ever did my own thing, I wanted him to do it. Uh, his name was Mark Baird. He's a gentleman out of Michigan and probably the most talented, creative human being that I ever was around and spent time with in a, in a tree stand or in a, um, lodge across the country somewhere. Mm -hmm. So I knew I wanted him to do that. And when it was time to go, then he was uh, available to do so. But just to kind of give you an idea, with airtime, full-time camera guy, travel cost, uh, hunting license cost, production cost, my annual budget was a half a million bucks is what it cost me to be on yep. uh, the networks. Yep. So a lot of money, uh, took a lot of work. Uh, and, and, the, and the reason I don't do it today is that um, unfortunately my dad uh, got terribly sick here several years ago and uh -huh. uh, ended up having dementia uh, and, and basically needed 24 hour care for quite a while. So I just quit doing everything that, well, I quit doing everything basically. So I stopped doing my show. I stopped uh, traveling. I stopped everything to take care of him while he was still here with us. So I wanted to make sure that I knew totally. he uh, put a lot of time into me as a young man. And I want to make sure that when he needed me, I give it back. Absolutely, man. Family's number one, so you, you did the right you, thing there. Um, but really, at the end of the day, it all happened uh, for a reason. Everything worked out like it should. So when that, when when the traveling hunter, or when I stopped traveling hunter, um, I immediately took over here at CVA, which I was already working for CVA. I started at CVA in two thousand nine. Was already working with them, uh, but when my dad passed five years ago, uh, I took over influencer relations. So I handle. Well, I handle everybody underneath our brand of what I used to be. Writers, bloggers, um, magazine owners, editors, publishers, TV show hosts, pro mm -hmm. staff, uh, shooters, uh, and also podcasters, which I never was a podcaster. But uh, right. So I handle all <laughs> aspects of media now, yeah. uh, which is a, a really easy thing to do because uh, everybody that I work with, I have actually, except for a podcaster, stood in their shoes at some point. Yeah. And it's not too much different. It's just kind of talking a lot <laughs> yeah <laughs> for sure which you're good at so <laughs> but it, it, it works out really well I, I i enjoy working everybody i know they're i know and understand their passion because like i said i've stood in their shoes before yeah. um and now as a company man it's very easy for me to uh try to fulfill their needs and help them reach their goals uh because i know what they need from us yeah and so um but you were able to to make that show obviously work financially, um, yeah. despite the costs. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, it, you know, I, 
again, being in the outdoor industry since I was 19, I started that show when I was 39, I believe is right. So I already had a lot of very great uh, business partners and acquaintances in the hunting right. industry. Yeah. Um, so it always comes down to, you know, the old scenario and everything in life. It ain't who you are, it's who you know. Yep. Uh, and I knew a lot of people uh, just for the sheer fact of my time um, working in the industry. So I, at that time, I was about, I guess I was, well, basically 20 years in the game at that time when I started my own show. So mm -hmm. uh, had really strong relationships across the board. Cool. And so I know you just kind of said what you're doing at CVA, but what is – like I know you do a lot of traveling still and put on different events and stuff like that, and and also on the Bergara side, um, and you just got back from doing a bunch of stuff. What were you doing? Like some kind of turkey? Yeah, we were. Uh, we just were out in Oklahoma and on our Bergara side of things, which is our, our high end uh, semi production rifle manufacturing. Um, we do what we call the Bergara Experience, and that basically uh, we do kind of a, a social media campaign to like. Where, hey guys, we're going to be in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We've rented a range out there. Who wants mm -hmm. to come out and test drive the Bagar rifles um, for an entire day? So basically, we put on this big giant shooting event uh, in different ranges or at different ranges across the country. Um, and doing that, we bring in a big caterer. Um, we had Hooray Grills, uh, which mm -hmm. is a really big uh, outdoor grill company. We had those guys. Uh, over at the Tulsa event, and they were there cooking all kind of meat on site. And we hang out for a while. We put on a big feed. Uh, then we go to a long to the long range portion of things and teach nice. people how to shoot uh, a thousand yards. Uh, and they run our guns, everything that we make. They run our ammo. Don't cost anything other than just a little bit of participation prize to pay for some of the uh, some of the swag. Yeah. And um, do we run guns for? four hours on a range and when it when it's done it's not a hard sales pitch everybody goes home and they had a good day on the range and hopefully learned a lot of new techniques of how to shoot long range yeah that's that sounds fun man i i need to get uh Dude, it, it is so fun man and i need to get like, on so that when we, when we do these events we've been doing them for uh well we're going on our fifth year of doing these these bagar experiences and we we try to do two to three each year and we travel to different regions of the country whether so like here uh, in a couple of weeks, we're headed to Michigan and we're going to do a long range shooting event up there in Michigan. Nice. But we go from Oklahoma to Michigan and we've been in Wyoming and we've been in Montana and we've been mm -hmm. in Alabama. We try to hit different regions or portions of the country each year. Um, and when we put these on, they literally are full within 10 minutes. Wow. And we have, we typically limit it to about 80 guests. Uh, per event, because that's all myself and our team can handle uh, yeah. in a full day. Um, but they they basically book up in minutes, uh, and then there's always a giant waiting list at the end. Uh, so uh, what's really cool is it's kind of kind of become a cult like following, if you will, to where that typically each event we put on after the first two years we'll have eight to ten states represented. So it's not just local people. They'll fly in, drive wow. in. We've had them drive. Excuse me. We've had them drive. Literally two years ago, we were in Montana. We had people driving from Virginia, South Carolina, wow. Alabama, Georgia, Dang. all the way across the United States of America to Montana to eat food with us and shoot on the range for four hours and go Jeez. home. It's That's crazy. a serious drive. <laughs> it's crazy awesome these people are so excited to come to these events so wow yeah pretty cool stuff but the, the job now definitely does um uh require a bunch of travel through the yeah. summertime and then one of the greatest things i feel that i get to do uh for our brand because i do work with 18 different tv shows that we sponsor um uh, I typically a as a man get to go on a hunt with each one of these tv shows uh throughout the spring and fall so even though that I'm not actually doing TV and stuff like that anymore, I'm actually still doing TV uh, for the CVA and Bagara brand, depending on obviously which show that I'm going with. Yeah, uh, I still get the two TV. I just don't have to come up with a half a million bucks every year. <laughs> that's that's nice. You just get to go and have fun and <laughs> go say, have see fun. Ya. <laughs> no, that's cool, man. Um, so I got. Could you pick a favorite hunt? You've traveled a lot and done a lot of stuff. Could you pick a favorite hunt or a favorite oh, species? Question, 
So you mentioned earlier talking about uh, going west and how that yeah. uh, is a whole new ball game, different mm -hmm. rifle setups and different strategies and techniques and all that kind of stuff. Well, even though I live here in Nashville, my heart is in Wyoming. Um, oh, yeah. So I am uh, a big mule deer fan. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I know you can't see it, but like on the other side of this door behind my head is a 22-foot giant wall, trophy wall, uh, and I got like 70 mounts on the wall. Oh, dang. A western side and a eastern side. So I got one side for whitetails and one side is for western big game animals. Are you on a phone right now? Sir? Are you on a phone right now? No, I'm on a computer. No, I was going to say, go take me out and show me, but it's all right. <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty it's pretty slick. I'll tell you what I do. Hang on. I can, this baby's mobile. Oh, nice. Right, there. Bear with me as I walk out here. Oh, you're good. All right, guys, if you are listening to the audio, go to YouTube and check it out. You're about to see the Smotherman Trophy Wall. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, so you got white tails on the left. So that's that's Whitey's there. Yeah, There's and then. down in the floor on pedestals. Ooh, that's a nice. Where'd you kill that around. bull at? So that's a, that's a Wyoming bull. Woo, that's a nice All one. those Wyoming muleys, a couple 180s, a couple 200s, another wow. Wyoming bull. Well, all those are Wyoming bulls. That's a, that's a, that guy there's like 353, I believe. The one on wow. the fireplace there is 372. Woo. Yep, all those, and all those are muzzle loaders. All of them. Everything, yep, pretty much, yep. Wow. Yeah, so, uh, and then, of course, now, are you hunting mainly muzzleloader seasons, or are you hunting general seasons with a muzzleloader just because you want to, or both? No, so a lot of those were or de definitely dedicated muzzleloading seasons, yeah. but like the the elk side of things were not. They were just general rifle situations there, and I didn't hunt with a centerfire up until like, my gosh, maybe four or five years ago now. So okay. from 1992 until... Well, four or five years ago, so 2016, 2017, I hunted exclusively across the country with muzzleloader-only stuff. Just because you just like it. I just liked it, man. I got infatuated with it, man. It become it become a problem, and um, I become a collector of muzzleloaders. So I, yeah. I'd say probably across the board, I probably have one of the larger collections of muzzleloaders in the country. Just wow. because it just become a thing for me, man. I just That's... love the mechanics of it. Uh, I love teaching people about it. I loved getting youth involved in it because I think um, I really think at the end of the day, it allowed young people to understand the mechanics of a firearm better because they could mm -hmm. see the powder going down. They could understand what the bullet looked like. They had to push the bullet down. Uh, so all the mechanics of it just really just drove me crazy to where I just couldn't get enough of it. And like out West, when you go into Montana and Colorado and Wyoming, some of those states do have dedicated muzzleloading seasons. Some do not. Um, yeah. My buddies that I hunted with in Wyoming all the time, I'd go out there during a general rifle season, which typically was November 1st, and they're like, dude, for real, what are you doing with that muzzleloader out here? <laughs> well, why are you not shooting a 300 rum? Yeah. I'm like, well, I'm a better hunter than you, dude. I can get closer. I don't have to shoot them a thousand yards away. I want to yeah. see the whites of their eyes, bro. That's awesome, dude. <laughs> yeah, I... I love the simplicity. Well, like this tag that I got this year, it's muzzleloader tag I got is uh, it's it's New Mexico, and they just went to no optic. Mm -hmm. So there's something Woo. there's I'm something back a little bit. Yeah, there's something, but there's something really cool and like just about the simplicity and like just kind of the uh, the old. I don't know the nostalgia of it or something. I don't know. I, I oh, like yeah. it too, man. Um, I've got a Colorado muleter tag uh, for September, uh, and it's an open sight. Uh, okay. Yeah. State. Yeah. Yeah. I actually drew a um, a Colorado muzzleloader um, antelope tag as well this year. Ooh, this but year? It's, yeah. Oh but, man. Yeah, but it was kind of a it was kind of a a backup in case I didn't draw anything else. So I may actually end up having to return that tag. I'm not sure yet. Um, if I can pull off that, that trip as well, but, um, Hey, while you're out West, just swing through New Mexico and then up to Colorado. I know. Well, it's gonna, it's, it's that, that tag is actually in September that Colorado. Ooh, okay. Yeah. Which man, I wish I could make it work. I just don't know. 
because I'm also I'm, I got a couple big trips. Um, so I do that New Mexico hunt, and then I'm driving as soon as that is done up to Montana. I got a general elk tag in Montana. Oh my gosh, good for you, bro! Sounds like yeah. a pretty solid year for you. Oh, dude! Oh, in August I'm going to Alaska. So it's oh, really? very solid. Yeah. Oh my goodness! So what's going on in Alaska? So I'm going the last week of August up to all the way up. I mean, we're flying up to Prudhoe Bay. And then um, I found a guy. You know, everything in Alaska these these days is like two years out booking, oh, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, but I called this guy that I knew some other guys in the industry who had hunted with them. Um, and they got a, they got a, f- a fan boat operation. Um, oh, on one of these yeah. rivers and they do drop camps and he was like dude we're booked like two years out i could maybe squeeze you in you know in two years and i was like okay how about this take me up on an off day i don't need a drop camp i'll take all my own stuff and i'll float out in a pack raft when we're done you don't have to pick me up he's like oh my gosh bro that's sick yeah he's like all right we can do that <laughs> so, so that's what we're doing man we're taking you're gonna be like about 35 miles up a river and uh and drop us and then we're gonna hopefully kill two caribou and float out god man that's just a dream man I, we have over the years spent a bunch of time up in alaska but it was mostly for hunting black bear down the round uh, okay. the prince william sound area yeah um, truly amazing trips but uh the fall is so busy during uh, uh doing i guess in the lower 48 hunts it is always tough to get up there and, and yeah. do alaska fall hunting yeah, I guess the the good thing about it is is there a lot of good opportunity in August up there. But I guess you know if you're if you're into like early muzzleloader and stuff, there's a lot of places in the Midwest you can get on some killer deer hunts early with the muzzleloader. Yeah, dude. Too. So Kansas has an early September hunt, mm-hmm. um, but typically we started in August as well. But we started over in Newfoundland, okay, in Newfoundland. Um, so we start in Newfoundland or Newfoundland uh, super early, uh, and then work our way back into the United States. And work our way across is kind of how we started out. Those, yeah, those, those um, um, different con- or continents. Um, uh, what would they be called? Provinces. There you yeah. go. Provinces there you in go. Canada. Some of those start pretty early over there. So, um, and that's a great thing too. Obviously, I'm super pro muzzleloader, but uh, yeah. that's a great thing about muzzleloaders too. Is this? There's so many opportunities across the country to hunt with a muzzleloader. You know, mm-hmm. you can go to, you, and I know you're going to say some of this is unrealistic, but it's absolutely possible if you want to do it bad enough, but you can hunt in Newfoundland, come back and hunt in Kansas, uh, 1st of September with a muzzleloader when people are still not bow hunting yet. Yep. Um, then from there, you can go up into Kentucky, which has a really amazing early muzzleloader season, which is like the 15th of October. Uh, and then from there, man, you can just bang all the way through and, and still be running the same gun that you started with in August all the way into to January. Yeah. Um, you know, like Nebraska has Nebraska and Iowa and Missouri have an amazing late season muzzleloader hunt after Christmas when most people are pretty much wrapped up for the year. Yeah, um, we, we have that too here. We got some really good late season muzzleloader opportunity uh, around here, um, which is pretty cool. And um, man, you never told me your favorite hunt though. Did you have one? Oh, it's absolute hunt mule deer. Oh, oh, okay, you did say that. Yeah, okay. without question, Wyoming mule deer, man. Um, you know, that it's just, I think, uh, obviously growing up here in the South, you know, you, you dream about hunting someplace you think you'll never be able to go. And that, that Western push was always very strong for me. Yep. Um, just because growing up here, um, the West is a big place. Mm-hmm. Uh, and unless you're connected, it's, it's hard to consume that you're going to go out there and try to do it on your own. Uh, and thankfully a gentleman took me out there, uh, when I was I know, late twenties, I guess, and then after that, that's all I can think of is is hunting Wyoming, Montana, Colorado. Yeah, uh, yeah, it changed it changed everything for me. Man. Actually, my first trip ever was in Alaska. Believe it or not, wow, uh, my big, first that's a big start. I know. I went with somebody who'd been a, a few times, um, and uh, it, that was a life changing trip. And then we did Kodiak the next year, and uh, this will be my third time in Alaska. But um, but yeah, man, and, and muzzleloaders have come a long way since you know I used to have that the old night disc rifle, oh, yeah. and that thing would take forever to clean. Oh, it's brutal, bro. Like I remember that baby was new, son. 
Oh <laughs> yeah, and that th- and I was a kid too. Like I didn't want to spend like two hours cleaning a gun every time I went out. So I kind of dropped it after a while. But um, um, you actually kindly sent me a LRX. Like I keep looking over because I got it sitting right over here. Um, and that thing is sweet, man, with the 209 powder, and uh, it's pr- it's pretty easy to clean. Um, I got the oh, uh, oh, man. the globe you know, sight so, on that thing and getting dialed. You know, we're talking about technology, and obviously we had some technical difficulty here earlier. But technology <laughs> is when it when it's good, it's amazing. And uh, from the night disc rifle days that you're talking about to our break open CBA muzzleloaders, and that's the Wolf Optima and Accurate series that we build today. Yeah, um, technology has come a long ways, and and. When I first started hunting with a muzzleloader, it was a side lock. It happened to be a CVA, uh, St. Louis Hawking, actually, side lock. And I'd have to soak that stupid thing in the bathtub for 15 minutes and hear my parents scream at me for this big, nasty, black crud ring around the <laughs> rim of the tub. Um, and now with modern propellants, no, so technology has changed in manufacturing and the muzzleloaders in general, but technology has also changed in the projectiles that we shoot, mm-hmm. the powder that we uh, use to propel those projectiles, and the most modern powder that we're using now is Black Horn 209, which is a yep. loose powder, um, and it, it doesn't have any sulfur in it, so it does not corrode the muzzleloaders like what people thought they used to. Um, you can clean it up with water. It's not hydroscopic, so it doesn't absorb water, so it doesn't affect you when you're in inclement weather, hunting in snow or rain. So the modern advancements in everything that we have, the gun, the powder, and the bullets has helped us out so much that it makes life so much easier to be a muzzleloader hunter today. Yeah. Yeah, man. And um, yeah, it's just, it's a it's a simple weapon, but um, really well made. I guess, you know, they got the Bergara barrels on them, um, they do. which is pretty cool. Um, and, uh, what was I going to, I can't, I just blanked out on what I was going to say, but, um, but anyway, I've been taking that thing out. Like I've been trying to do like one range a week already just because, yeah, you know, it's a new gun, new system. Um, and, uh, I want to be this tag. I, it's ridiculous, man. I haven't even killed an elk yet. This is my first elk hunt ever. And it's like a 1% draw odds, New Mexico elk tag. Like it's pretty wicked, but, um. So I'm trying to not too much put too much pressure on myself, but at the same time, like, you know, do the hunt justice. So I definitely want to get, you know, I'm getting my system dialed in. And uh, one thing that, you know, recently I just switched over, you mentioned it earlier, from volumetric to I started weighing my powder out because you I started noticing. the next level now by weighing yeah, powder. Yeah, I, I started noticing, um, you know, I do my little eyeball measurement or whatever, and then I get to the range and it's like way different, like just because of temperatures or whatever, like expansion. And mm-hmm. and then um, I even started looking at some of the plastic tubes and like putting them next to each other. And some of them are, are way different. Oh, big time. <laughs> and you know, so that's... I'm like, dude, what? This is ridiculous. I'm going to start weighing my powder. So I got me a little scale and I'm just over there like, ding, 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 ding. Oh, like, yeah, dude, that so thing. We're, weighing, we're weighing powder now down to the 10th of grain. Um, oh yeah, which has uh, really changed the game for us as far as as long range shooting with a muzzleloader, because that that those two uh, scenarios never come to play up until recent long range and muzzleloader that yeah. that, that they didn't comprehend. Right. Um, and back in the day, um, when I first got into muzzleloading, the accuracy guarantee in a night muzzleloader was seventy five yards. I mean, today I can throw a muzzleloader pretty decent at 75 yards. Um, and I, and I, I think, too, we also um, have more modern technology in optics than we had before. Yeah. Um, we always ran 3 by 9 by 40 millimeters before, and now we're running uh, 4 to 18s with the 34 millimeter tubes and adjustable yep. turrets of, you know, 60 MOA adjustment and all this stuff that never um, – never come into play back in the nineties and two thousands. Yeah. And, um, you know, today, some of the muzzles that we manufacture, I mean, I have very effectively run them at sub MOA sub minute angle out to 800 yards. Whew. Jeez, dude. Yeah, it's insane. That's I mean, crazy. I, I think back in the day, we thought the bullet disappeared after a hundred yards. <laughs> we, we just didn't know where it went. Yeah. We didn't have the scope to be able to figure out the drop and the adjustment with, you know, there were no, 
hash marks in the scopes or anything like that. It was just yeah. a crosshair. That's it. Yep. Hold three inches higher. Hold over his back. That's <laughs> yeah. all we had, you know? <laughs> yeah, dude. Um, so as far as, as far as that goes, are there any other, um, like small, like accuracy tips that you might throw in other than weighing your powder that might help me out? Uh, so d- depends on which projectile you're shooting. Here's one thing to keep in mind. So, um, so we own CBA, we, as a, as a brand own power belt, uh, bullets, right. um, and they are, they have a gas check in the back, but they're basically considered a full bore bullet, meaning that that bullet does not ride in a sleeve or yeah. a sabot or a sabo, depending on how you say it, where you're right. from. Um, but the, uh, one thing that I learned over the years is, so also while I was working for night muzzle, as I become a competitive shooter and I shot on the night rifle shooting team in friendship, Indiana, uh, for eight consecutive years. And, so you probably uh, know Jim Shockey then. Oh, I know Jim. Yep. Yeah. Jim and I worked together for a long time. And when Jim ended up leaving night rifles, that basically opened the door for me to take over his position as oh, okay. in essence, face of the brand. When he left, I started doing all the commercials. Uh, I was okay. the face in all the commercials. I was the face in every print. Cause he was ad. doing like everything. Mus- I, the first time I ever came across Jim Shockey was he was doing like the slam with the muzzle night muzzle letter. Yep. Yep. Called the ultimate slam and in, in night at that time. Uh, still does actually at that time started that slam owned the name and the rights to the intellectual properties of ultimate slam. Uh, and then, um, for the most part, Knight paid for most of those hunts that Jim went on back in the day to try to uh, nice. accomplish that, uh, slam with the muzzleloader. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I interrupted you though. You were saying something though about, I don't remember. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, oh, I was saying, do you have any other accuracy tips other than yeah, weighing so, powder? So, so back in the day, everybody run a uh, sabot projectile or a mm. bullet that was riding in a sleeve. We right. call it a sabot or sabot. Um, and uh, there's only one sabot manufacturer in the world. Um, that is a company called MMP, Modern Muzzleloading Products, I believe is right. Interesting. Um, so they make uh, a three, uh, three-ear or a three-leaf sabot or a four-leaf sabot. And basically, those leaves, uh, when they uh, are expelled out of the end of the barrel, out of the crown, they those leaves or petals on the the sabo fold backwards and and basically fall off the back of the bullet, almost like a parachute on a dragster, if you will, yeah. or like a wad off. and a shotgun shell. Yes, yeah, just like a wad. And a, and so basically, it's a wad. Yeah. Um, so if you're shooting a sabo projectile, which I know a lot of people still do shoot that kind of uh, projectile. One thing to make sure is that you want to do for accuracy purposes. So, like when that um, when that bullet and uh, sleeve or sabot leaves the barrel and it's going out, the pedals on it will fold backwards, so it will do just like this. And when it does that, it pinches the base of the bullet because of the hinge point at the base. Okay, mm-hmm. so you always want to make sure that when you're loading your muzzle loader, it's basically going to be lean, leaned against the bench. Your belt buckle is going to be facing your ramrod, basically, with the gun leaned against the bench. You always want to make sure one of those pedals on that sabot always faces your belt buckle or faces the ramrod so that each bullet or projectile leaves the barrel identically every time and the base of the projectile has the same pressure applied at the same location identically uh, as the one before. So awesome. in muzzle loading, um, accuracy is all about consistency, meaning yes. you're going to do the same thing identically every time to achieve yep. long range, proper accuracy. That's a great tip. Um, okay. That's good. So yeah, I'm, I'm shooting Barnes right now. Barnes T E Z and I have some yep. Magnum M Z as well. Uh, Barnes is a partner yep, so, of mine and I so have really great luck with their uh, center fire cartridges. So, um, I really like shooting solid copper, and um, so that's what I'm shooting and now. Some but... of those states require the solid copper projectiles, too. Um, yeah. We could go on at this point make one of those in a power belt, um, in a power belt line. But those those uh, Barnes bullets you're shooting, uh, I helped design those with Randy Brooks of Barnes oh, nice. Bullets back in the day when Randy actually owned Barnes Bullets. Um, the night rifle bullets that we had back in the 90s and 2000s, we called them night red hots. Um, and they were 250s, uh, 285s, 290s, um, in yellow or black or blue sabots. Um, and, uh, they were amazing. 
projectiles and got to work hand in hand building those uh, with Randy Brooks to make them, well, what you're shooting today. Nice. Okay. Well, that's a great tip. Um, I hadn't and here, and so thought about here's, that. Here's one thing to think about too. Um, uh, and I'll ask you this question. If you were going to go today to pick up a muzzleloading bullet, what weight would you typically drift to? Um, well, I drifted to 250. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> that is the most common projectile weight in the world. Uh -huh. is a 250 grain bullet no matter what the maker is whether it's a power belt uh everybody tries to hover around a 250 yeah but let's think about this for a minute let's get so again i talked about earlier behind my mind is mechanical uh -huh. let's think about the mechanics behind this 250 grain projectile so you think um that the 250 is going to be it's, it's a lighter projectile it's probably going to fly faster and shoot flatter because it's lightweight um, but there's a hundred different reasons why you should not shoot a 250 versus shooting at 300 or larger. Hmm. So we'll think of, so you remember the days when people in the archer world would shoot an overdraw and they would shoot a really short arrow because it was yeah. wicked fast. Right. But then it'd probably be like all over the place. Well, guess what? People don't shoot anymore. Short arrows. Yeah. Because and they're putting weights they, on the end of their arrows and stuff now. Yeah, because they were they were wicked fast, but they were super erratic, and it just wasn't what people thought they were going to be. So the overdraws yeah. went away. So a 250 grain projectile is basically the same as that overdraw arrow. Hmm. It's very short. So when a bullet gets heavier in the muzzleloading world, the bullet gets heavier, and and I guess Cinefar too. Now I'm thinking about this. Uh, the bullet gets heavier, so it doesn't get fatter. If it got fatter, it wouldn't go down the barrel. Right. It just gets it longer. It gets longer. Yeah. The longer it is, the better it's going to stabilize in flight. So do you think it's worth changing? Uh, if I was shooting what, what you plan on shooting, I would be shooting the 290, um, which is a 290 TMZ. Um, mm -hmm. I believe it has a blue um, polymer tip on the end of it. Yeah. It's amazing. So, I mean, you think, you think um, given that I'm – maximum 200 yards, probably 150 and in with open sight. Do you think it'll make a noticeable difference? All right. So let's, let's go to the, another reason why you should shoot a heavier projectile. So let's say, say you got two vehicles going down the road side by side, both are running 60 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. One is a Volkswagen, brand new, ultra lightweight, super economical. Then you got a 1965 Cadillac right beside it that weighs four tons and made out of the heaviest steel known to human existence. And they're both running side by side, parallel, going down the street yeah. at 60 miles an hour. So if both drivers slams on the brakes identically at the same time, yeah. which one's going to stop first? The light German one. The lightweight Volkswagen. Yeah. I guess in my mind, I was thinking 250, that's a huge projectile, like. That's big enough, you know what I mean? So 290 is going to have more kinetic energy because it's bigger. It'd be like it'd be like uh, me hitting you versus the refrigerator Perry hitting you. Yeah. Bigger, massive fist, going to be more kinetic energy, going to knock more teeth out because the refrigerator Perry's got bigger hands than I got. So yeah. for Muslim world, we have one projectile. We have one bullet to make your trip from your home to New Mexico a coveted tag, thousands of dollars in tag and travel expenses. We have one bullet to make your hunt a success. We want the most accurate, heavy hitting projectile that we can because in our world, we work off kinetic energy. Yeah. Our muzzle loaders are, in theory, depending on powder charge, but today on average 2,200 feet per second. A centerfire rifle is on average 2,800 feet per second. Mm -hmm. So a centerfire rifle shoots a lot of projectile, but a lot faster. So when it hits an animal, it vaporizes it, basically. Yeah. Interior, interior of the body cavity turns to juice. Right. These muzzleloading projectiles are like a dump truck. They're moving along, kind of slow, methodical. But when they hit you, they rattle your retinas. Yeah. So the bigger the projectile is, the more kinetic energy you're going to have, which is going to be uh, more ethical for harvest, um, more um, kinetic energy put into the animal. It's going to be more accurate 
um, because of the projectile is longer. Uh, and here's one thing to, to kind of add to that, the third reason why you want to shoot a longer projectile. So I know in your scenario with open sights, you're probably not going to be shooting long range. You're talking about 200 yards and in inside, which I agree with that ethical uh, yardage. But in general speaking, if you plan on shooting a little bit further, um, the heavier projectile carries its weight and energy forward moving inertia, carries it longer like the 65 Cadillac does. So your 250 grain bullet, if you zeroed at 100, is probably going to drop 12 to 13 inches at 200 yards. The 290 grain bullet is probably going to drop 13 to 14 inches at 200 yards. Because even though it's bigger body mass, and people think mechanically, oh, it's heavier, so it's going to fall like a lead balloon quicker. Mm -hmm. But it's not the case. Actually, the heavier projectile, because of the moving mass behind it, um, will actually shoot flatter at longer ranges. So mm. you have a more accurate projectile in a heavier one, more kinetic energy, and sh flatter shooting trajectory in a heavier projectile versus a, a lighter 250. Oh, I think you got me talked into it. <laughs> oh, it's a, it's, and, and man, when I first was really dug into the well of muzzleloading and traveled a lot, uh, I was a 250 man as well. And I had explained to me, many times over and over again that the heavier bullet was better. And I'm like, it just doesn't make sense to me. But after we, we broke it down and talked about three, the three reasons why to shoot a heavier projectile and then shooting them at long distance and seeing the imprint on paper, light bullet versus heavy bullet, then it become very clear to me that the heavier yeah. the better. Okay. Um, well, I might uh, rethink. I got pl that's, that's got plenty of time, so I'm glad we talked about. It. Now I think I might uh, rethink that decision. But uh, so uh, you know, obviously heavier isn't. There's always you know there's a balancing point where like you don't want to go too heavy. But I think sure. I, don't, I think you you would recommend a 290 though for that. Yeah. The so bars. in the bars lineup, the 290 is is about as close to 300 as you can get. Uh, but if I can hover between. 290 and 330 is kind of the sweet spot, uh, I feel, for uh, okay. anything past that obviously does get a little bit too heavy. You're talking about a threshold, and that gets past that threshold of being just yeah. too big at that point. And so right now I'm shooting 110 grain by volume, which to in my math worked out to about 85 grain by weight charge. How's that sound yes, to you? Correct. Money. Money. Uh, and, and in theory – the hundred, if you're a volumetric powder measure guy, um, the according to according to Hogden, it should be seventy seven grains by weight. But I did my own, and it was eighty five. Well, I mean, you definitely got to check it because I I know I've checked a, a bunch of stuff that I found online, and it, it did not fall to be true in my yeah. own personal world. I'm not saying that they were telling a story about what they printed; it just was not that right. way in my world. Yeah, right. Um, but. Um, in, in, in the muzzleloading world, most muzzleloaders that are on the market today are what we consider a magnum muzzleloader, mm -hmm. meaning they can shoot up to 150 grains of powder. Um, but uh, I would wager to say that your car that you drive around every day says it'll run 120 miles per hour, right. but it probably handles better at 65. Oh, yeah. Um, a sure. a muzzleloading bullet is the same way. Yes, you can push it with 150 grains of powder, but a lot of times it, it's too fast and it gets a bit erratic. Yep. You will gain some muscle velocity and a touch of kinetic energy, but really at the end of the day, uh, it's not how fast you hit them. Yeah. It's where you hit them. So typically that 100 to 110 grains by volume is really a sweet spot where it's super accurate, but you also have enough speed to do what you need to do. Yep. Anything past that seems to be a little hot and make things erratic in flight. And it starts to hurt really bad at the range. Well, you know, I mean, it went <laughs> off face out of your mouth for sure. Dude, that thing, is, I started, I mean, seriously, I started putting like a like a towel when I go to the range on my shoulder. Because after like 10 shots on that thing, like it starts to hurt, man. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, but you're pushing, uh, a, you're pushing a bunch of a, a bunch of lead. Well, in your case, a bunch of copper, copper in front of that dude. Yeah. Um, so, so last question on that. Um, I asked the guys at Barnes this on a podcast, but I want to hear what what you think. Um, you're going out to the range to you know do some uh, to do some work, verifying, sighting in, whatever. Mm -hmm. What is your shooting and cleaning procedure for the the best kind of accuracy that you have found? 
Uh, really great, really great question. Um, and it's a topic that gets asked all the time. Um, for accuracy in a muzzle loader, it's all about consistency. Um, and consistency is weighing your powder, uh, doing the same thing every time. We've already touched on that topic, but it goes down to the ritual on the bench. So I know a ton of guys that say they uh, shoot three shots and then they swab after the third shot and shoot all over again. Well, um, even if you're shooting black horn, um, everybody says you don't have to clean after black horn, but uh, if you shoot black horn one time, you swab the barrel, you'll notice there will be some residue on a patch. So every time you shoot, whether it's you're shooting pellets or loose powder, or whatever the case may be, every time you shoot, you build up a residue inside mm-hmm. the, the barrel. So when you do that, the barrel gets smaller. Mm-hmm. Yep. Just layers of powder residue. So if you wait till three shots or five shots to clean, um, that fifth shot or that third shot is harder to load than the first shot because the inside diameter of the barrel is getting smaller. Yep. Um, and when it's harder to load, it's also harder to get out. So it's going to build more chamber pressure because it's got to push through the tighter bore because of mm-hmm. the um, crud that you've built up inside there. Yeah. So if it's harder to get out of the barrel, it's in, it's in essence the same way uh, or the same scenario as shooting more powder. So if it's harder to get down the barrel, the point ignition, it has to build more chamber pressure to push the bullet out of the barrel. So it's exactly the same as shooting more powder every time you squeeze the trigger. So for accuracy purposes, consistency is key. And the only way you can be consistent is shoot the gun, swab the barrel with a damp patch, swab it with a dry patch, load it again. That way that every time that bullet leaves the barrel, it has the same amount of restriction as the bullet did before. Right, right. It's identical the same way every time. And here's also another scenario. Say damp, you, with, damp with bore blaster, like a cleaner, or... Uh, well, I mean, with if you're shooting Blackhorn 209, the most modern propellant out there, you actually can do that with, with just spit on a patch. The old mm-hmm. scenario, the spit patch that the mountain men used forever yeah. ago, you can actually do that with Blackhorn. If you're using like a, a Pyrodex pellets or uh, white hots, you typically have to put a little uh, cleaning solvent on a patch, run it down. So typically my scenario is run the patch down, the damp one, flip it over. Once you've run it one time, then run it down the second time. So one patch, two passes, mm-hmm. and then run a dry patch down one time and then reload. That way that I know that the internal uh, portion of that barrel has the same cleanliness every time I squeeze the trigger. Hmm. But let's say you didn't. So you're getting good accuracy um, with a three-shot or a five-shot group in cleaning. So at the end of the day, you've got your gun zeroed in. You feel pretty confident with it. You've shot five times. You're going to clean it. And then you're going to load and you're going to go hunt tomorrow. You're going to go hunt next week. So your last shot that you're going to take is, oh, that's a good shot. Was shot five times with a very dirty barrel. Yep. And then you're going to clean it and go hunt with a clean one tomorrow. Not cool. Yep. So if you clean after every shot with two patches or uh, a damp and a dry, then every time you go to the field, you know, I have the same restriction inside my barrel as I did when I was on the range. I have a clean yep. bolt. So that's interesting. So can I so can I tell you what the ballistics guy at Barnes said? Sure. He said he said go to the range with a clean gun, shoot it twice. Don't clean it. Those are fouling shots. Don't count them. Mm-hmm. And then shoot okay. three times and those are your three shots of record. Then clean it. Okay, so not not to argue with that gentleman because I I probably know him, Greg um, Sloan. So this that scenario and there's is nothing all, personal. This is just this oh is just, yeah no. So yeah. so here here's my uh, uh, counter argument of that or counter statement of that if you will. So at the end of the day, you've shot your gun, mm-hmm. you got it zero to where you feel good. I'm going to go and get her cleaned up. I'm going to go hunt next week. Right. Well, he says go out and shoot twice before you hunt with it. So, so when is the, <laughs> what time does opening day start? <laughs> That's true. It might not be able to shoot twice before you go. My point exactly, my man. If you're Gosh, on the yeah. range and you shoot 
every shot is a clean bore, you always know what you have. That's mm -hmm. true. All right, that's food for thought. I'll have to. Yeah, food for thought. Food for I might thought. have to change my whole system now because Smotherman told me to get two nineties oh, and clean man, every we time. Throw, we throw the monkey wrench in your. Well, that's why throat. we're doing this in June. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, man, this is this is awesome. Well, I I could probably sit here and talk to you for another hour, but um, I'm sure you got stuff to do. Oh man, um, dude, I'm I'm just tickled to be talking muzzleloader, man. Uh, yeah, right. it's been fun. I'm very thrilled for you to get to go out to New Mexico. Uh, I've hunted New Mexico many times there in Mejila with the muzzleloader. Okay. Um, and it was not with open sights. It was when they allowed optics. So yeah. I don't envy that side of it, but I do envy <laughs> you, and I'm super proud that you're going to go take a run at it. Yeah, man. Um, yeah, I'm stoked to be shooting a CVA, and um, it's it's a lot of fun to shoot. It's uh, it's a it's a, like it's a well-made weapon. Um, I'm, I'm stoked with it, so... So thanks for that, and um, um, you bet, man. Proud for you, man. Yeah, man. Um, hopefully, uh, you know, season two there'll be a a nice uh, little bull going down on camera. Lord willing, we'll see. Well, I, uh, <laughs> just so you know, uh, I will be stalking you uh, through the World Wide Web of Instagram or something other yeah. to see what you're up to out there. I want to uh, I want to see some updates on it. Absolutely, I'll, man. I'll living, keep you informed. Uh, I'll be living through you. Well, dude, you're probably busy mid-October, but you're welcome to join. I will be in Wyoming. Okay, cool. Well, I, I had to throw it out. Good, good. <laughs> I'm glad. Like that's the thing is like I, I think I'm just gonna bring my cousin because it'll be a fun story. Because like that first LBL hunt we went on, I was with him. This was our mm -hmm. my first ever Western animal on public land DIY. I was with him, and so it, and my first ever public land animal was here in virginia i was with him so it'll be kind of a cool story and, I, and all my oh, other he's like, like he's industry like hat man yeah yeah and all my other like industry friends you know it'll be busy and i think it'll be more it'll just be more fun just to have my cousin like both of us go out there and don't know what the crap we're doing and like maybe stumble across like some sick bull you know <laughs> oh my gosh man you know just just you guys been out there together, you know, at the end of the day, it's, there's, there's a couple of things important. And, and one of the important things is family. And absolutely. It's, it's awesome that number one, that, well, number one, that he has the ability and time to take off to go hang out with you. But yeah, um, well, I'm still bugging him on that. He hasn't confirmed yet, but <laughs> well, maybe, maybe it'll happen. Cause I, I'm going to tell you when you get a bull down, uh, especially like that area that we used to hunt out there in the Gila, man, you get a bull down, you need help. Oh yeah. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. For sure. So hopefully that'll work out, man. But uh yeah, let's let's stay in touch and um you know, check out the first season of the show. The actually the first episode just aired on Monday and it'll run again at noon on Saturday. So if you get a chance to to flip it on, it's uh, reaching those goals, man. That's awesome, dude. Yeah. It's a it's a it's a cool hunt. It's a DIY public land zero point uh Wyoming antelope hunt. That went out there so, and we, so did, with your uh, inaugural airing did you have friends and family over and hang out and watch it together so yeah the first airing was on a monday so i didn't but i'm actually having a little party on saturday with some some folks coming over to to kind of have a little watch party to celebrate it yeah dude that's awesome i did the same thing man when my personal show hit the air the first time yeah. and it was it was awesome um, yeah it's it's a lot of work man it's worth celebrating you know oh absolutely man for sure yeah. Um, it just shows how much fun you have doing it. Uh, the downside is people watching with you don't realize how brutal of work it is behind the scene to make it <laughs> oh happen. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> well, my wife will realize cause the amount of time I spend spending this chair, but, um, but yeah, man. So, well, it's been great talking to you, dude. Uh, we'll have to do another one uh, after the season Bro. and just catch up and see how their seasons went. Man, always a pleasure, man. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. And if you guys listen tonight, if you have any other questions or concerns about CVA, you can always go to CVA.com and find anything yep. that we manufacture. Uh, or if you want to just want to hit me up personally, um, anything that I do on social media is always traveling hunter. Cool. Yeah, man. Well, thanks again. And, uh, we'll, we'll be in touch, man. Appreciate it. All right, all right bro. Take care. Call me if you need me. <laughs> thanks, man. Yes, sir. Bye-bye. <laughs>